Our next story is from Mark Gersh, who likes to call his tale, What's Old is New Again. Please welcome Mark. I have a friend who's a phobia therapist, and she said if you get nervous, you should imagine your audience naked. <laughs> but with all these bright lights and everything, and I decided not to do that, so I'm just going to hold a rock instead. <laughs> My story begins in 1967. I was 10. It was 22 years after World War II, and America was no longer living or abiding by war rations and everything old was new again. Muscle cars, new fabrics, <laughs> blue suede shoes, Elvis Presley, and two stories homes. Americans were buying things as quickly as they came off the shelves. Everybody was buying except us. Like Peter, we were poor, dirt poor. We lived off the kindness of strangers and my mother's grit, ingenuity, and determination. She fancied herself an artist and was the first bohemian person I've ever met. <laughs> For her, everything had a second life and was a salvaged treasure, including people. We were fed by the school we were loved by the community. We swam in cow troughs. We climbed silos. We went to the highest trees. We sat on the branches. We relaxed. We put our hands up to the heavens and we touched the sky. We belonged to the community and the community belonged to us. It was all for one and one for all. My mother loved color. Even though she couldn't afford all the fancy things and the fancy clothes, she loved color. She decided one year, when I was 11, to paint her brown car blue. <laughs> with spray paint. <laughs> it was one of those days when you should not spray your car. And the little droplets flew all over the house, <coughs> her and everything else. And she was done. She said, look at this. So I opened the car door, and it was two-toned. <laughs> but she was happy. The next year, she came home with a whole carload of shag carpet remnants. They were filled up the whole car. You couldn't even see. So she yelled to us four boys to come out and get these carpets, and we did. And she held them up as if she were looking at a diamond tiara with all the greens and blues and yellows and purples. And those of you old enough to know what a shag carpet is, right? <laughs> you have your own story about shag carpets. <laughs> so I asked her, what are we going to do with these, knowing that every day was Christmas and my mom was the cool mom? And she said, we're going to put them on the walls, of course. <laughs> so the next day, she came home with a whole case of spray glue. We took the carpets outside and we sprayed them on another hot, I don't know why she chose hot August days, but on another hot August day. And as we were spraying, the drops of glue went like the spray paint over on our eyes, on our clothes, on the steps, in the house, everywhere. But the smell of the glue was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it was delightful. And within hours, we had the whole neighborhood. And you have to remember, I grew up in a little town in western Kansas, a small little Catholic town, with six people in my class and seven of my brothers. So the whole neighborhood was like 30 people, right? But we were all spinning in the front room, deliriously happy, <laughs> twirling, 
pretending we were drunk. <laughs> and it was, once again, wonderful. She was the cool mom. A year later, my father got cancer, and he asked her to return. I knew that concept was boiling with trouble. My dad was a landmine. He acted out in rage. He hit us kids when we were making noise, and if we were too rowdy, he took off his belt. Most days he was gone, having spent the night with somebody else or at the VFW. My mom left him the night she found him passed out in a parking lot in the back because he refused to go to a hospital to visit my brother. So her, the idea of her returning to him was simply astounding to me. And I asked her why. And she said, it's her duty that she believed in people and she was going to keep her vows. And then she said, you are going to face new opportunities and new challenges. Right now, you're a small fish in a small sea, but you will rise to become a big fish in a big sea. I knew there was no changing her mind because she was indomitable. As we drove away, I put my hands on the windows, crying tears, knowing I would never see the people again that I loved. We got to Salina, the town I was moving to, and within weeks, I knew there was gonna be trouble. There were multiple buildings. We had no backpacks. We still wore our hand-me-down clothes, cinched up with belts or twisted our, our um, collars or our waistbands. And the kids began picking on me. They, you know, the thing about being poor is you don't know you're poor and somebody tell, tell somebody tells you you're poor. And everybody was poor when we grow up. It was just, we were the poorest of the poor, but it was one for all and all for one. So the concept of people picking on me for my clothes made absolutely no sense. So I went home and I told my mom I had to have different clothes. And of course, we couldn't afford new clothes. So she went to garage sales and estate sales and wherever she could, and she got us different clothes. And I wore them to school, and the kids at school laughed because they knew they were their clothes. <coughs> and they demanded I take them off. Um, my father, same song, second verse, he wasn't drinking anymore, but he started being gone a long, long time doing things we don't know, spending money we didn't have. Um, so I asked mom if she would leave, and she said no, because I haven't faced my challenges. There were things I had to learn and opportunities ahead if I looked at them in the right perspective. Um, I thought that was bullshit. Because <laughs> I was the one going to school <laughs> alone being picked on, but once again, I knew that when my mom made up her mind, that was it. High school started, and three things happened almost simultaneously. I was changing clothes in gym. My waistband was tattered. Kids came over, and they started pulling it off, and I started fighting with every tooth and nail and breath to hold it on, and they won. The gym teacher came out, looked at me, in my nakedness and turned around and walked away. My creative writing teacher, what we call an English teacher now, gave me an assignment or the class an assignment. And she said, write a story. And I did. I wrote a story about robots. And I loved robots. I still do. Astro Boy was my favorite cartoon. I have Astro Boy stuff. And she wrote, this is the worst story I've ever read. F minus, F minus, F minus. So I went home and my mother was crying because she found out my dad had a series of affairs. And I was glad he did because I saw that as an opportunity for her to leave him, for us to go back to the idyllic community we grew up in. She had a solution. She said, no, 
I begged her to. She said, I still love him. I called her a liar and a hypocrite, and she slapped me hard across the face. And at that moment, my heart turned cold and my face turned ashen. And I realized, no matter what I said or did, I was going to be on my own. So I did what I could. I tucked my head down. I got jobs, as many as I could, working at fast food places or other jobs, babysitting, raking, mowing lawns. And I decided to be home as much as I, I mean, away from home as much as I could be. I saved my money, I bought clothes, and when the bullies came to me, I glared at them with this look of hate in their eyes and they backed down like bullies would do. But I knew, I knew the moment I had the opportunity to leave, I would. I did a lot of fun things. Like I said, I bought a car. I went to prom, you know, those purple suits or green suits or brown suits with those huge collars and ruffles. I did a lot of that stuff. But I did it knowing I wasn't going to get close to anybody and I was going to exit the moment I could. The night of graduation, I packed my bags and the next morning I left. I stayed with my sister in a town 90 miles away. When school started three months later, I had saved money and I moved into the dorm. In the little idyllic town we grew up in, the world was expansive. I was free and I grew. In the town we moved to, the world was hostile. I was afraid and I deflated. In college, I felt like I had been released from prison. It gave me an opportunity to do things I wanted to do without an audience watching over me and a history I had to report to. And I was gonna do everything I decided to do. Within three weeks, I was recruited by a social fraternity and I began to drink heavily, as much as I could, as long as I could. One night, after drinking that way, I found myself under a bridge, filthy, on an October morning, shivering. I walked across the hallway of the dorm, knocked on the door of the nerds that lived there, and said, would you teach me to study? And they did. When I graduated from college, I was at the top of my class. When I graduated from high school, not one counselor came to get me to talk about my options. Three years later, or four, I was working at a hospital doing statistics because statistics and economics in college were my favorite subjects, um, gathering data. It was at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And I had free roam at the hospital People liked me. I had nice clothes. I had a nice apartment. And I had enough money to do what I wanted to do. But inside, no matter what I did, no matter how much respect I earned, I felt like I was a poor boy wearing fancy Brooks Brother clothes, trying to live in an adult world, but pretending to be something I wasn't. So I went up to the cancer unit and I began to talk with these young men whose families were estranged from them for no other reason of whom and how they loved. And I began to despair. I had everything I ever ran from that I wanted and I was unhappy. I didn't want to kill myself, but I saw no reason to go on. So I decided to go into counseling because I truly was becoming like my father, everything my mother said. And within weeks, I told this counselor how I despised my mother for her weakness, 
never leaving my dad, how I blamed her for every miserable, sniveling, pathetic thing that happened to me. And she said, we live our lives forward, but we review it backwards. And in order to heal, you have to go through what you've gone through all over again. But this time, it will be new and it will be different. So I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so I took her to her word. I went back and I decided to walk in the path of my parents. I asked my mom why she stayed with my dad. I wanted to know. And in the process, I told her everything I just told you. And she cried and she cried and I cried. There was some part of me that wanted her to pay for all of the things that she did. And there were some part of me that wanted her to be my mother again. After I told her all the things I just told you, she t told me all the things she'd never told anyone. She told me things that broke my heart, that made me laugh and made her see her as her own woman, her strength, her good, her bad, and her ugly. As I was getting ready to leave, she grabbed my hand and she said two things. The first is, do you see this? And it was a piece of broken glass that she was gonna put into a tumbler and make into a mosaic of stained glass. And I said, yes, I've, I've seen that all my life, right? And she said, do you know why I do this? And the why had never occurred to me before. And she said, because I see the face of God. I put something into a tumbler and it comes out differently, new. It's the same piece of glass, but it has a different life. And I realized that was my mom's entire philosophy. She never quit on anybody or anything in spite of the fact that she felt humiliated and raised us by herself. And I saw my mom in a completely different light. I saw her filled with integrity and love. And I knew that she didn't try to do those things to hurt me. I saw her as she was and not as I needed her to be. She grabbed my hand and kissed me on the cheek and I, she said, am I still your mother? And I said, no. <laughs> that ship sailed a long time ago, sweetie. <laughs> no. But she, she persevered. She sent me a letter a few days later that started with my beautiful son. I still have it. I framed it and I put it in my office. Now it was time to do the same thing with my dad. When my dad died at the veterans hospital years before, the last words he ever said was, the devil is coming to get me. He shot up out of bed, uttered those words, and died. And I always thought devil was literally the devil, like in Ghosts. Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, snarls, coming to take his soul to hell. So I had two questions for my grandmother. Did she believe my dad was in hell? And why didn't he stop drinking for us, for me, for my mom? So I asked her the second, the first question first. Does she believe my dad was in hell? And she said no. She never believed that concept. Even as she heard it coming from his lips, she knew he was having a flashback. Germans were the devils. And that my dad, every day of his life, walked in a living grave like the people in Ukraine today, war is a contagion. I was a casualty of war, just as surely as my father was. Trauma becomes multi-generational. And the saying in my field is, is trauma is not the person refusing to let go of the past. It's the past refusing to let go of the person. So I asked her the second question, why could he stop drinking when his life was on the line? Why didn't he stop drinking when ours was? And she said, honey, somebody can't give you more than they give themselves. And I realized she was right. And then I 
began to see all these puzzle pieces falling into place. The kahubas and the ding-dongs and the whistles. And I saw his screaming at us to be quiet. I saw him coming upstairs when we were rowdy to get us to calm down. He needed quietness. She also reminded me that he was hit by a grenade during the war. He has grapnel in the whole right side of his body and lost his hearing. I never put all that together. It wasn't that he didn't want to play basketball with us and ride a sled and climb a silo and swim in a trough. He just couldn't. And I saw him as a 17-year-old boy, like my grandmother did, who came back from four years in war, being in a hospital, and after the war ended, had to work in the graves registry, exhuming bodies. And those memories never left him. I got in my car, I drove away, and I cried. I cried for all the things that could have been and all the things that never were. So I went back to my job. I went back to my counselor. It was still the AIDS epidemic, And I could tell I was changing. The bits and pieces of me that I hid, that I refused to let people see, were starting to fall away. And I felt like I could be that kid again, climbing the tallest tree in the tallest park. Put my hand to the sky and pet the clouds. So as I was finishing up counseling, my therapist asked me what I wanted to be, and I said, you. I want to be you. I want to listen. Two years later, I was sitting in front of people just like me, people with broken, fractured homes who, who were saying that they were pretending to be something they weren't, creating the same stupid problems. And I would pick up a piece of glass I had in my office and turn it around and I'd say, you're not useless. And I tell them the story of my mother and stained glass and her belief in God and say, your life doesn't have to go on this way. We're not gonna change the past, but we're gonna change the present and the future. And you're gonna have to go back and walk your walk all over again, this time with you in it. And I promise you, your life will be different. And since I've realized the secret to happiness isn't financial wealth or giddiness, but it's learning to solve your problems successfully, not making too much or too little of yourself, mixed with faith, perseverance, and understanding, I haven't met a piece of stained glass, shag carpet, or redemptive story I haven't loved. Thank you. <laughs>